Professor Dawkins, 23 years ago, you've been the guest on a very famous BBC programme called Desert Island Disc. Oh, yes. I love it very much. And I would like to borrow the basic idea of uh, this programme for our interview and uh, like to invite you to be my fellow castaway on the um, island of this lovely conference room. And um, please forget everything around us. Uh, it's just a Fata Morgana and it's just the two of us. And funny enough, your latest book, Science in the Soul. And uh, in that book you write uh, that it was actually a children's book that initially planted science uh, into your soul, which I hope is, a, is an atheistic soul. Yes. Um, is Dr. Doolittle translated in German? Do you know? Yes. It is. Yes. yes. I loved Dr. Doolittle. Uh, he was my childhood hero and I kind of fantasized about being able to talk to non-human animals, I suppose at the age of about seven. And uh, I, so I Im imagine myself Dr. Doolittle. I now see him as rather like Charles Darwin, the young Charles Darwin on the Beagle, because Dr. Doolittle were always going on ships, little ships about the same size as the Beagle. He was usually wrecking them. And he was a great naturalist. Charles Darwin was a great naturalist. And they were both very kind, gentle pe people. They both hated slavery. Um, so I, I now rather identify Dr. Doolittle with, with Charles Darwin. But I suppose what I mainly learned from him as a child was, um, uh, uh, it wasn't called speciesism in those days, but nowadays we would call it speciesism, the assumption that there's something very special about humans uh, rather than other animals. Darwin himself, in a different way, was concerned in several of his books to uh, unite humanity to the rest of the animal kingdom. He was, in the expression of the emotions and the descent of man, um, a lot of those books are about making the connection, making the resemblance between humanity and other mammals. Hmm. Fascinating. Um, do you talk to animals? <laughs> <laughs> well, Conrad Lawrence, wrote a book called King Solomon's Ring in English, I can't remember what it is in, in German, um, where he claimed the gift of talking to animals. But no, I, I died. Ah, ah, what a pity. Nor do I, mm. but I'd love to. Um, you write in your book that um, you grew up with the usual uh, religious influence of your time. As a boy, you were even in a, in a church choir. Um, I wonder, at that time, did you believe in God? Yes, much of the time. Uh, when I was uh, about nine, I kind of worked out that there were lots of different religions and they can't all be right. And so that made me sort of suspicious and I was quite argumentative at that time. I then went back and I was actually confirmed in the Church of England at the age of 13. So I suppose, and I think I was fairly devout at that time. It didn't last very long. But you can't really remember believing. Okay? Oh yes, I can. I can remember very much believing. I can remember praying and, and sort of feeling uh, in, in a sort of little cosy corner with God. I wouldn't want to give the impression that my parents indoctrinated me, not at all. It was only, it was only school that I got this. Okay. You're now uh, one of the leading atheists uh, in the world, if not the leading atheist. Uh, and, of course, a passionate promoter of science. Uh, what do you think makes science the better approach to the world compared to religion? Well, it's true. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, there, there's evidence for it. Uh, it, it, it is the, the, the only good reason to believe anything is evidence. Uh, and, of course, so the, the scientific method is the method of discovering what's true about the world using evidence and using logical inference and if a better way were discovered then that would become part of science as well. So science of course advances, science changes, science makes mistakes, it advances by its mistakes but it's ever uh, ev all the time advancing closer to what is true. I'm one who actually does believe in objective truth. I, I have little time for 
fashionable nonsense like science is only just one approach to the truth and there are other approaches to the truth. It's the only approach to the truth, at least the, the truth about the real world. You can argue about other kinds of truth, like what's morally good or something like that, and that's a separate matter. But even things like, uh, how do you know your spouse loves you? That is evidence. It's not, it's not the same kind of evidence as scientific evidence. You don't do, do experiments, at least I hope you don't. Um, but um, nevertheless, it is the same kind of evidence mm. in, the, in, in the sense that you use little looks in the eye, little quirks in the voice and so on to, as evidence that your spouse loves you. It's not a purely subjective internal feeling. Okay. I often uh, hear the question, why not having both science and religion? I mean, would it really be so bad? We're sitting on our island here and... Uh, that we pray for the rescue forces to come to us and, and uh, save us from our little island. I mean, there are quite a lot of people, even scientists, who say, um, for me it's no problem to, to be a scientist and at the same time to believe in a god. I think it doesn't do any harm if we're on the island to pray. I mean, it, it's not saying much more than, well, I wish somebody would come and rescue us, or I hope somebody comes and rescues us. Um, but I do think there's something perniciously anti-scientific about uh, the very idea that there's something supernatural that you can pray to. It's, it's better to realize that the world is the world. It's, it's just a, a, the, the real world governed by the laws of physics. Praying is not going to work unless it works by increasing your psychological determination or something of that sort. I mean, it, it could have some indirect effect like making you more determined to stay alive because you, you feel that you may be going to be rescued because you prayed. I mean that, but that's obviously not what we're talking about. We're talking about the unreality of thinking that there's somebody up there or out there that you can actually, who's listening to your, to your prayers. That is subversive of the scientific enterprise. The scientific enterprise is always, always trying to find the true cause of everything. In my case, as an evolutionary biologist, the true cause of life where life comes from, why it's the way that it is. And the whole Darwinian enterprise is founded on the success of the Darwinian explanation of complexity, of the kind of things that are capable of creating and inventing by gradual, slow, step-by-step, -step, incremental process, which is evolution. And so the very idea of a supernatural god is deeply antithetical to certainly the evolutionary science, and I, I think to, to all science. Um, although you're perfectly right that there are scientists who claim to do both, who claim to be religious and to be science, scientists at the same time, of course that's true. I think there is something subversive of the scientific enterprise. And if you closely question one of those scientists who, who claims to be religious, you'll often find they're not really religious in the sense of believing in anything supernatural. You'll often find they, oh, well, I'm, I'm spiritual. Um, I believe in there's something deeply mysterious in the universe. Well, so do I. Um, but I do not believe anything supernatural. I don't believe in any sort of spirit that, that can listen to your prayers or forgive your sins or hear what you're saying or speak to you. Um, that, I think, is subversive of, of science. Okay. You have often said that you think religion to be um, rather a dangerous thing. What are the negative effects of religion and, and non-scientific thinking uh, we can see in the world today? Well, having dealt with the subversive effects of science, which is not really very serious, what is serious is the, the effects on the world today, as you say, and only yesterday and today in, in Berlin uh, I have met um, ex-Muslims who have fled from their home countries and who are actively pursued by relatives, by brothers, by uncles uh, who want to kill them because they have um, dishonored the family, because they've deserted Islam. That is deeply evil. The, 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 the idea that a a view of a metaphysical view um, of the world, of morality, of, of um, what, what's, what's going on, 
which we call a religion, that that can so take over, so parasitize a vulnerable human mind as to warp somebody into wanting to kill their sister or their daughter for deserting the religion. So we have the manifestly evil effects of religion which grab the headlines in the world. They're not actually as important as some of the headlines might make out, but nevertheless, um, there is a, a deep evil in the, in the world today which is religious fundamentalism. Uh, in America, it's not quite as bad as that in the sense that people on the whole are not killing each other for it, not often anyway. Um, nevertheless, uh, there is a, a fundamentalism in, in, in America which um, is, leads people to do things like blow up abortion clinics uh, and to, to um, take political decisions, vote, voting for candidates who support nonsensical anti-scientific beliefs like that the world is only 6,000 years old. And people, people who believe that nonsense actually have the vote and in, in America you only have to look to see what's happened. Um, good question that comes now after this. Uh, do you think mankind has a future? Sorry. Do you think mankind has a future? And if so, what do you think this future will look like? We obviously have to be worried about global warming and there are things like that that are troubling and uh, we really need to take political action over that. I am rather encouraged, however, by one or two recent books like uh, Stephen Pinker's Enlightenment Now and The Better Angels of Our Nature, like Matt Ridley's The Rational Optimist, like Michael Shermer's The Moral Arc, which take a more optimistic view and which, when looking at the broad sweep of history, as opposed to the local lo time we happen to live in, um, do feel that we are getting better, that the world is getting better. Um, partly morality, uh, the better angels of our nature, looks at the improvement in our moral values over the centuries. So it, it takes time and we have short-term reversals, which we're in one at the moment. But also Matt Ridley's Rational Optimist, having great faith in the power of science to solve problems. So even the, the, the really serious environmental problems which we, which we face, uh, there are some people who believe that science will come through, that it, it has the resourcefulness and the power to, to solve them. So I think there are optimistic straws in the wind which, which give me some courage. Okay. Um, there are scientists who say that um, the future will be more religious because religious people tend to have more children. Um, do you think that the future will be more atheistic, uh, scientific, or more will we have will we experience a, 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 rigid, a religious backlash? The suggestion that religion will increase because religious people have more children, of course, that depends upon the assumption, the grotesque assumption, that children inherit the religion of their parents. If that's true, we've got to do something about it. I mean, I'm afraid it possibly is true. But nevertheless, we should not assume that it's true, which is what that calculation does. And what we all do when we talk about things like Catholic children. It is an outrage to talk about a Catholic child. This child is too young to know what it believes about, about anything serious mm. like that. So we have got to stop labeling children with the beliefs of their parents. That is child abuse to do that. And when, you, when people say something like, um, religion will increase because religious people have more children. That automatically is assuming that children inherit the religious beliefs of their parents. And it is a sin to make that assumption. Never, ever talk about a Catholic child, a Protestant child, a Jewish child, a Muslim child. Okay, I won't. <laughs> um, do you think uh, um, a world without religion would be a better world? Undoubtedly. No question about it, yes. Um, those, those benefits of religion, so-called, uh, um, amount, it, to my mind, like things like great works of art, which of course historically is undeniably true. Um, we would not have the Sistine Chapel, we would not have the B minor Mass uh, without religion. Um, on the other hand, the only reason for that, of course, is that that's where the money was. I mean, they were, they were, they were paid, they, they were subsidized. Um, and we could 
get plenty of inspiration for great art um, from science, from reality as opposed to fake reality. Um, as atheists, we often talk to religious people about their faith um, and uh, we often hear, but isn't life without religion meaningless? What do you say to them? How dare you? How dare you is what I say. If, you, if, if, if your life is meaningless, just die and, 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 and leave it to, the, to those of us who can appreciate it. Life is wonderful, the world is wonderful, the universe is, is wonderful. The understanding of the world is wonderful, the understanding of the universe, the understanding of life is wonderful. And it's a great privilege to be here to understand it. The very idea that life is meaningless because when you die that's the end of it and you're only living this life as a sort of rehearsal for the next life. What a pathetic loser you must be if you think that. Okay. I know you don't. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, undoubtedly you are an expert uh, regarding discussions with uh, religious people. And do you have some tips um, for your fellow atheists? Um, how can we make people understand the negative influence the needlessness and, and the nonsense of religion and the benefits and beauty of science without losing our minds while discussing with them. Yes, I'm, I'm not sure I'm the best person to ask about this. I, I've, um, I, I get criticized for being too in your face and, and not seductive enough. And p there are people who say, well, the right way to approach the religious people is to woo them, seduce them, say, um, it's okay, you can keep your Jesus and you can you can keep your God and you just need to understand a bit of science as well and gently, gently, softly, softly. I think that is a good approach and I'm glad some people do it. It, it, it doesn't suit me very well, I think. It's, it's not what I do. I think I prefer to put it out there and say, here's the scientific, here are the scientific facts, here's the evidence. And it's wonderful. I, mean, I, don't, want to, I don't want to downplay it. I don't want to make it sound as though it's somehow mundane and, and, and ordinary. It isn't. It is wonderful. It's glorious. I try to convey that in the sort of same sort of way as Carl Sagan did with, with astronomy. I try to do that with biology. So to that extent I try to seduce. I try to seduce with the beauty of science. But I don't try to seduce by uh, trying to meet people halfway and saying you can keep your religion. I don't think you can keep your religion. I think, I think it's nonsense. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why many people think you're um, aggressive. Yes, they think I'm, I'm aggressive. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm polite in, in personal in, encounters. I, I guess I s sometimes do sound a bit aggressive in print. Um, there is another factor though here, which is that uh, we've been so used over the centuries really to hearing religion treated with kid gloves and not attacked directly, that even relatively mild criticism of religion comes across as aggressive. It sounds more aggressive than it really is because it's so unaccustomed, but if you compare it with theatre criticism or restaurant criticism or something like that, you will hear just as aggressive words. It's just that we're used to theatre criticism and restaurant criticism as being outspoken. It sounds more outspoken when it's religion because we're just not used to it. There are people who think that any criticism of religion sounds like a personal attack on them. Which of course it isn't. It's like say you've got an ugly face. Or it's nothing like that. It's just it's it's about a world view, and a world view is not a a person who sh who suffers from criticism. There is another approach um, to criticize religion, uh, a rather modern one, and that is um, to create invented religions, parodies like yes. the flying spaghetti monster. Yes. What do you think about this approach? I think that's quite good. I mean, I I like satire. I like the use of of comedy. In the case of the flying spaghetti monster, um, that's especially useful for those people who say, well, you can't disprove God. I mean, you can't prove there is no God. And of course that's true. But it becomes trivial when you realize you can't disprove the flying spaghetti monster either. That not just the flying spaghetti monster, but an infinite number of possible things that somebody could imagine. Pixies and leprechauns and pink unicorns and, and uh, flying spaghetti monsters and, and everything. Um, and, I, and, and another way to do that is to point to all the thousands of other religions which have existed in history and do exist still 
all around the world, and they're all different from each other. And people just make them up, and they can't all be right. And there's absolutely no reason to think that the one that you happen to have been brought up in is the correct one. Okay. By now, it has become night on our little island. There's a magnificent starry sky above us. And um, we did not only save your book uh, from the wrecked ship, uh, but also a bottle of wine. And uh, while we're drinking it, we're slipping into a philosophic kind of mood. You know, this kind of mood where you ask questions that you mm, usually don't ask. And um, my first question watching this magnificent sky above us would be, what is man? What is man that thou art mindful of him? Uh, man is a forked radish. Um, man is an animal, is an African ape, uh, a product of evolution, a survival machine for his or her selfish genes, uh, one of possibly 10 million species of living animal, possibly billions of species of extinct animal and plant. We are one of a huge branching tree of living creatures, the product of biological evolution. The ultimate purpose of man and of any other creature is the, the propagation of the DNA that programmed our development. And that's uh, true at its own level. Uh, that doesn't mean that that's the purpose that we all have in our own life. That's a very different matter. We can all have different purposes. I think it's important to, on the one hand, understand that we are the product of the forces of physics and the product of the forces of physics deployed through the rather peculiar process of evolution by natural selection. On the other hand, that's what's produced us. That's what's given us our existence. On the other hand, We've also been given big brains by that same Darwinian process, and those big brains are capable of rising above our biological origins and of giving us the capacity to do mathematics and philosophy, the capacity to love and hate, uh, to, to write poetry, to produce art. Um, so we are a lot more than our biological bodies, but we are nevertheless simply the emergent properties of our biological bodies. The German philosopher Immanuel Kant uh, once said that all philosophy aims at three questions, and that is what can I know, what should I do, and what may I hope? I'd like to vary this uh, a little bit and ask you, what do you know? I know what uh, any 21st century scientist knows. Um, I know quite a lot more than my predecessors of 100 years ago or 200 years ago, 300 years ago and so on. And I don't want to reel that off, I mean, it's in any, in any textbook. And I think it's important to, to just mention it because it is a great privilege to know what we do know and which our ancestors didn't know. I am fond of saying something like, you in the 21st century could give Aristotle a tutorial. You could blow Aristotle's mind. You could, you could fill him with wonder at what you know as just an ordinary person who happens to be blessed to live in the 21st century. Um, I, th I guess you could probably blow Kant's mind as well. Um, so that's, that's what I know. Um, I suppose I know other things as well which are not scientific. I mean, I, I know things about my fellow humans which, um, as I said before, uh, I, I gain not by strictly scientific experiment, but by, by the sort of evidence I, I, I know what it's like to be human. I know what it's like to feel, to think, to love, um, to desire. Uh, and so that's a different kind of knowing, which is harder to explain scientifically, but is nevertheless very real to each one of us. Um, I guess that's what I know. Okay, and what do you do? What do I do? Um, I breathe and walk and live and love and, and um, write and um, 
read and go on holiday and wonder at things and look at the stars and look down microscopes um, and um, pretty much what other people do. What do you hope? I hope for a better world. I hope that um, I can make some small contribution to making it a better world. Uh, I hope for an end of tribalism, an end of nationalism, an end of religion, um, a full appreciation of the beauty of life, the beauty of the world that, that we live in, um, a full education so that people can really appreciate what, is, that there, what there is to be known, which is now rather a lot, and are not benighted in um, superstition and um, traditional falsehoods. Uh, an, an end of suffering, a reduction of suffering. Um, uh, yeah, that's what I hope. And what is sacred to you? Truth. Truth in the scientific sense. Uh, truth about the real world, objective truth, uh, which is beautiful and needs to be guarded because it's under threat. There are people who don't value truth, who subvert truth, uh, who even say that it is not important that um, you make your own truth nonsense like that. Um, truth is there, truth is out there, uh, and it's up to science to, to, to discover it. That is sacred, and I think that if sometime in the future there comes a time when everybody ceases to believe in objective truth and th says things like, everybody has their own truth, truth is simply what's politically expedient, uh, then I would despair. Are there important things in your life you wish you had done or you hadn't or would have done more or done less? I've wasted a lot of time. Uh, I've wasted a lot of time. Um, well, in part of my career, for example, I did a lot of computer programming, which was stimulating intellectually but wasn't really advancing knowledge very much because others can do it better. Um, so I suppose I regret that. Um, on the whole, I'm, I'm pretty happy with my life. Could be better. I sometimes, I, was, I once um, was um, asked to uh, give advice to, well, it was, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you the story. The story was a television company uh, sequenced my genome in, in its entirety, which is not often done, and put it on a, 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 floppy, on, on a disk. And the, the idea was they were going to bury the disk, and then in 500 years' time it would be dug up, and uh, I would be cloned, which would be, make an identical twin of me in 500 years' time. Uh, the, and um, th this was television, you understand, and so the conceit of the program was that, and the, and the purpose was to do things like discuss philosophical issues like, would the clone be me, or would it be, and obviously it wouldn't because it would just be an identical twin, that kind of thing. Um, but also, I was, I was supposed to give advice to my young, 500 year younger clone, what mistakes did I make? Um, what, would, what, what should I have done? Don't make the mistakes I made, you've got my genes, so, so you make, make better use of them, that, that, that kind of thing. Um, the program was never made. I mean, it, my, my, my genome was sequenced, but then it got diverted into some other, some other project, which, which was made, but, but, it, but it, it never happened. So I never really did decide what I would advise my, my young clone. Of course, the world in which he grew up would be so different anyway that my advice would be completely useless. But you still don't know what, what kind of advice you would give it? Your... Well, no, I think not really. I, I mean, I think I'd be much more interested to learn from him what, what things are like in 500 years' time. Do you ha uh, sometimes have uh, a memento mori and think about your own mortality? Yes, I suppose we all do, probably. And um, uh, as, I, as I've said before, I think um, 
I think I would like to live uh, live a long life, um, and and uh, there's a lot more to learn, a lot more to discover. Um, one of the main reasons I would like to live longer is to discover what's going to happen because things are moving so fast. Um, we live in a world of very great rapid change, which is exciting. Um, I'd like to see e exploration of the outer solar system. You know, people perhaps migrating to Mars and what it's like, and perhaps finding life on Mars, perhaps finding life on Enceladus, orbiting Saturn, um, and further exploring um, life biological research, embryological research. So I'd like to live longer for that sort of reason. Um, I think the idea of eternity is what's actually rather frightening about death. And it's equally frightening. And indeed, it's more frightening, I think, if you're, if you're there. So, as I've said, I, I'd rather spend eternity under a general anaesthetic, which is what's going to happen. But, but are you uh, afraid of death and dying? Well, I, I, I say I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of eternity, but as I say, under a general anaesthetic, it will be, it will be completely in, innocuous. And, and as Mark Twain said, I was dead for billions and billions of years before I was born, and never suffered the smallest inconvenience. It'll be just the same. Okay. Um, if you could choose, how would you wish to die? Well, peacefully and quietly, uh, um, I think that one of the more frightening things about being human is that we're not allowed to go to the vet and, and be painlessly euthanized. Um, we've, 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 we're condemned to die by natural causes, which often does mean suffering. So, uh, if, so I, would, I would rather go to the vet and be given a painless injection. Um, Dr. Doolittle, again. Well, I then sort of, yes. <laughs> um, when, you, when you talk to very religious people as an atheist, there will sooner or later be that sentence, just wait till your last moments. You'll be so afraid that you'll uh, return to faith. Do you think that that could happen to you? Yeah, no atheists in foxholes, yes. No, no definitely not. No, I would, I would be... Um, as Bertrand Russell said, I would scorn to shiver with terror. I would scorn to, at that moment, betray all my principles. Why would I? Of course not. I guess you know this famous story of uh, Christopher Hitchens' deathbed conversion. I, I mean, that's, that's just such a libel. I don't even want to go there. Uh, um, I mean, you're talking about the, that dreadful man who, who, who told lies about him. No, I'm talking about uh, the the story where it is switched around, uh, the story where um, the story of Christopher Hitchens' deathbed conversion, a priest goes into his room ah, when right. he's dying and then the priest comes out and is an atheist. That was Christopher Hitchens. Oh yeah, I got it. You know I, that story? I, I had never heard that story, no. <laughs> okay. That's it, that's Could it. that be something for you? Uh, I think so, yes. I think, yeah. Yes, I'd rather enjoy that. <laughs> okay. Okay, um, the rescue forces are almost here. I'm having my last sip uh, from the bottle and um, ask you my last drunken questions. Um, if I'd ask you, what is something in your life that you would never want to live without? What is the first thing that comes to your mind? Uh, human love. Okay. Uh, if it would have been up to you to create the world, either the way it is or not at all, would you have created it? Yes. Yes, I would. Uh, it's, interest, it's an interesting question whether there's any, there is any other possible way. Uh, I mean, Einstein was interested in that question. Um, is, there, is there more than one way for the world to be? Uh, and that's an interesting question. I don't know the answer to it. I suspect the answer is probably yes. Uh, but. Um, Yes, I mean, I, I, would, I would create the world if, if, I, if, 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 the, if the alternative was not at all. Yes, certainly. So the good points in this world are more important than the suffering? Yes. To you? To you. Yes, the good points and the sheer extravagant wonder of it. Um, what would you say is the aim of what you are doing, your books, your talks, etc.? Enlightenment. Uh, education, 
understanding, um, poetry even perhaps in some cases. Um, I think I've described science as the poetry of reality. Uh, I think um, science is an excellent vehicle for poetry and art. Uh, and I would like, I mean, I try, I aspire in my books to write in a, a style which is sort of poetic, prose poetry maybe sometimes, um, because the subject matter warrants it. What would you like to pass on to future generations? Well, a love of knowledge, a love of truth, um, the desire to discover, never to be satisfied until you learn more. Um, pretty much the same answer as, as to the previous question, I think. Okay. Last question. You've given thousands of inter interviews, I suppose, and uh, is there a question you have never been asked in an interview and would like to be asked and answered? Well, I have had an awful lot of interviews and they've, they have been, had a certain monotonous sameness about them. This one, I have to say, has not. I mean, this one has been more interesting and so I thank you for that. Um, I can't immediately think of an, another question I would like to be asked, but thank you very much for asking these questions in a, a different way from that which I've been accustomed to. You're very welcome. Uh, I'm glad that I didn't bore you. Not at all. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you.